Howdy y'all, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Today we're gonna go through a really awesome collection of photographs, all from the old world. Now, the thing that ties all of these images together, and look at this beautiful architecture here. It makes you wonder how cities like this were all arising at the same time when we're told this architecture spans over hundreds of years, yet it all seems to be uniform with the rest of the architecture in the city. It all appears to be of one harmonious construction, but I digress. All of the photographs today are going to be from the Detroit Publishing Company, which began as the Detroit Photochrome Company, a company that would take high definition or highly detailed photographs using advanced cameras from Switzerland, and then they would colorize these photographs or make these photographs of the old world into color. Now, this company formed in the late 1800s, and according to Wikipedia and other mainstream sources, we don't have a lot of information about the creators of this company. What a coincidence, but we're told the company formed in the late 1800s, and at one point, they purchased the process to make photochrome images. And from there, the company took off. Now, you're probably familiar with the Detroit Publishing Company. If you've seen this name mentioned before, it was probably in your old world research, because if we dive into photographs of the old world, you're almost always going to find one or two in every city around the world that was made by the Detroit Publishing Company. And many times these are the photographs of the old world that we see in color. But what we're looking at today are the photographs before they were colorized. These high definition images from the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s. And it begs a lot of questions. One of the things that I hear most often is when we look at these old world photographs as we do throughout all of my videos, we often see that these cities appear to be empty. Now, many will claim this is due to the photographic process of the time, to the cameras of the time. They took a long time to take an image. However, we also have images from the 1850s and the 1860s that include people in the photographs. And these aren't exactly people that are posing. They do appear blurry in some aspects, but you can clearly tell that they are people. They may be moving or walking down a street, but you can see horses in motion and other things like that. And many of these photographs are the ones that were turned into the photochrome or the colorized photographs from before the year 1900. Now, a lot of these in America almost exclusively were done by the Detroit Publishing Company. And that's why we're looking at these images today, because they, for the most part, held exclusive rights and brought this process from Switzerland to the Americas and then made the photographs of the old world that many of us are familiar with today. And when we do the research that we do into the old world and into this history, we often will come across these photographs again and again with the Detroit Publishing Company said to be the ones behind the image. Now, this becomes even more interesting because in a lot of these publications from the 1800s, we don't necessarily have a photographer. We don't necessarily have a date given. We have estimates. We have the year given, but not an exact date, as if these photographs seem to come from somewhere else. And then the Detroit Publishing Company, almost with their process that they developed, were able to claim these photographs as their own. And it makes you wonder. Now, we're looking through architecture here, but we're also looking through a handful of other anomalies that I found while going through the thousands of photographs from the Detroit Publishing Company. The interesting thing about this is, again, we're told this company began in the 1800s, and by the year 1900, their photochrome or their color images were some of the most popular images to be published all around the country of the United States. Now, where this becomes sort of irrelevant or where this becomes interesting, where this becomes more questionable, is we're told by World War I, the company was basically bankrupt and that no one was interested in photochrome images anymore. There was new interest in different techniques like video and movies, the video camera, the moving photograph. That is what took the world by storm. And we're told this company, with all of these images, with hundreds of thousands of images all around the world, the most highly detailed images from the 1800s, the whole company went bankrupt after World War I. And eventually, everything that they owned was taken over by the United States government. All of the images, we're told, were then given to the Library of Congress and made available to the public. And apparently, 
we're able to look through every single image online. But it begs the question, how much of what the Detroit Publishing Company actually published in the 1800s, how much of that came from before the reset, if we believe there was a reset? How much of it came from after the reset? Did they rediscover the process of photochrome? And did they apply the color to these images simply to win over the public who was already questioning how these photographs were so highly detailed, were able to show different bodies in motion when we're told other cameras of the time simply could not do this. It's a very interesting thing, a uh, dichotomy that's painted between what we're told in the mainstream and what we can clearly see in these photographs. Now, as we go through these photographs, one thing becomes clear, no matter where we're looking, we have these highly detailed images that were being published and there must be an advanced type of camera that was being used. And we'll dive into that in a little bit. We'll get into the current narrative, but we can go from Atlantic City to different places all around the United States to different places all around the world. And we can find this architecture that is so similar and yet so unique at the same time. And many of the oldest photographs will show us that a lot of the largest buildings in these locations seem to come to an apex, something we would call antiquitech. They appear to be topped with these devices, these different mechanisms that we simply cannot and do not understand at this point. Now, we're told they're ornamental. They serve no purpose. And in church-like buildings, they were for acoustics and things of that nature. But as we look through these different homes and these factories that are also topped with the same sort of mechanisms and we find that in the oldest photographs, they do not have wires. They do not have anything like that that is being applied to that. And yet, when we fast forward time, when we look at photographs from the 1900s and later, we can find that these same mechanisms, that the same tops of these buildings are then being supplied with wires, being supplied with electricity, as if there was already something in place that needed to be electrified, or there was something in place that was already serving a purpose and then it was refurbished or it was reset, it was renovated to again serve this purpose and or serve a new one. Here's a great example of what I'm talking about. On the left, you can see gas powered lights. However, there are also electric wires everywhere, telegraph wires, as well as old telegraph lines, this ancient antiquitech. We also have massive bridges, massive architecture, built with this sort of engineering that leaves much for us to desire as we read the narrative about how they were constructed. Look at the top of this massive building. Look at the tops of many of these buildings. Now, you can say that that is ornamental and you can say that these are flagpoles and other things of that nature. However, in all of these photographs, all of these flagpoles are empty and I did not include Every photograph here from the Detroit Publishing Company, obviously, because there are thousands upon thousands of them. But I can tell you for sure that there is Antiquitech on almost every single building that appeared in the 1800s, especially if they were buildings of some sort of important status. Now, whether that status was applied to them later after they were discovered or if this is just how they were being constructed at the time. One thing is for sure, we can look at the tops of these buildings and we see flagpoles and other things like that. Ones that are absolutely massive, that would be able to house absolutely beautiful flags. They would be able to send an absolutely positive message. They would be able to notify the public, much like a billboard. They would be able to show your pride in whatever it is you wanted to show on this flagpole. However, in every single photograph, we do not see flags on any of these poles. It would lead us to believe these were not flagpoles. The same with the Antiquitet on top of the buildings. So as we dive into this history, there's a lot that has been explained by the mainstream. It's been told to us that if we have any questions about it, we shouldn't because everything is business as usual. However, with our minds finally able to see through the charade that was history that we've been presented with, his story, we can finally start to peel back these layers and see that everything isn't exactly as we've been told. The technology appears to be founded, inherited. It doesn't appear to be brand new because if it was brand new, like we're told at the time of these photographs, you think that it would be 
used. You'd think it would be applied in a way that makes sense. Instead of having all of this Antiquatech, all of these flagpoles empty, all of these different devices seemingly not being used properly, and the people that are using them standing next to them as if they're almost shocked that they're next to such a beautiful item. They more appear to be in shock because of what they're witnessing, because of the architecture, because of the discoveries, because of the inheritance of the old world. But that's just a theory, and we're going to get into that. I have a little bit written about this narrative that I want to share with you. I want to get in my opinion a little bit, but be able to share historical facts with you according to the narrative. And then at the end of this video, I have a lot of esoteric alchemical processes that I want to discuss that seem to have a sort of bearing on what is going on in the world today now stick with me if you like to get into the more esoteric version of the old world history and these images themselves they're absolutely stunning so we'll get right into it a quick dive into the history books tells us that the detroit publishing company began sometime in the late 1880s started by william livingstone and photographer edwin husher those last names are unique livingstone and husher would purchase the rights to photochrome, a truly pioneering technique for its time, allowing for the mass production of colorized, highly detailed photographs from Hans Jacob Schmid of Switzerland. This implies to me that the only photochrome in America at this time would be coming to us from the Detroit Publishing Company, also known for its time as the Detroit Photochrome Company. Again, the history here seems to be key both to our modern day research of the old world, but also appears that this should have been a well-documented company, and yet the information we're provided nowadays really seems to fall short. The largest biography we have for any member of this narrative comes to us from William Henry Jackson, the most famous photographer of the Detroit Publishing Company. But he's also listed as the plant manager, implying that this company had a multitude of buildings in one location, possibly factories, which focused solely on the production of photographs. To put this into perspective, you'd be hard-pressed to go through a museum's collection and not see work from the Detroit Publishing Company. Also, you can go through really all of my videos, and at least one or two of the photographs in every video will most likely be from the Detroit Publishing Company, if not more. For roughly 50 years, these photographs, these photochrome or colorized or high-definition or highly detailed photographs, seem to be the greatest achievement of photography. I've made previous videos discussing the likes of Luxembourg and the massive achievements in photography which stem from that unique area of Europe. From the same region, we have cameras that grew and they developed, like living artifacts. And throughout Europe, we have mankind that was tinkering with these cameras. And by the end of the 1800s, we have highly precise, highly detailed images without any blurring of moving artifacts. We have photographs of old world roller coasters, for example, in motion by the year 1890. Were these accurate depictions? Are these accurately labeled images? Are they misdated? Or did photography really advance that much in just 30 years? Some people have claimed that some of these detailed images in some of my videos could be old world Photoshop. And in many instances, we do not see the sky or the sun or anything like that in these images. Again, this is attributed to the photographic process of the time. Photochrome images appear to be the most detailed images of the time, beyond the norm of the late 1800s. Nowadays, we have millions of dollars that go into city planning and renovations. In some cases, billions of dollars in the most major cities. And we still can't even come close to achieving the amount of harmony that we see in most of this old world architecture. Besides the architecture appearing more visually pleasing, more inviting, and overall more complicated than the drab architecture of today, one thing we can also notice is that there is a unity amongst the chief designs of most of these major cities. All these structures, for the most part, appear to flow into the surrounding areas, whether it's nature, other buildings, or something much more advanced. Almost every single aspect of these earliest old world cities appear to have been planned to match in harmony with the rest of the city. In modern times, these old world buildings stick out like needles in a haystack because they clearly don't fit the modern concepts that govern our society. However, in the old world photographs, we can see a certain balance, the cause of which we can visualize as the structures in the city 
all being of one harmonious design. Obviously, from the narrative we're given, this is impossible. These cities have multiple layers, multiple rebuilds, multiple architects, over dozens if not hundreds of years, over numerous disastrous events and advancements, which caused these cities, every single one, to rise at one point from a few hundred to over a thousand people to the number that we see when these photographs were taken. Every city started from a little something and eventually arose, whether it was from the indigenous people or whoever is given credit for it. But we must keep that in mind as we look through these photographs. When we see architecture that all appears to have been grown, it appears to have been built at the exact same time.